Now it's a great privilege to be with you again to uh, open the uh, scriptures and to seek to read and to learn from them. Just before we uh, come to our passage this evening, let's just commend ourselves to God in prayer, shall we pray? Father, we just bow in thy presence and again we give thanks for all that we've come to know and enjoy and experience uh, through the work of Calvary and the death of thy Son at the cross. We appreciate, Father, that as a result of his suffering we've come to the enjoyment of salvation and the forgiveness of sins, but we've also, Father, been given that great liberty uh, of being able to draw into thy presence. And so we come again uh, today uh, in our need, and we look to thee that thou be pleased just to give help. We think of passages of Scripture that we read, and we know that all Scripture is profitable, and we just pray, Father, that our study again today will be of profit to uh, all of us. We think just of the public reading of Scripture, and there's a profit in that, but we do just seek to read it and to understand it and to ap apply it, Father, to our lives as well. And we just pray for help, Father, in our time together today. And so we just commend ourselves to Thee and we seek Thy blessing. We remember again the needs of the believers at in our leaving and we are thankful that we can commend them to Thee, Father. Pray that as lockdown is lifted that we all might soon be able to enjoy times of meeting together face to face and sharing together both in the remembrance of Thy Son and in work and service for Him. And so we just commit our time to Thee. And look to thee, Father, that I would just continue to lead and guide uh, with regard to the future uh, until the Lord would come. We commit ourselves to thee, Father, and ask for help now and give thanks in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, as I say, it is a privilege to be with you uh, for our third, our concluding study uh, in Luke's Gospel and in Chapter 7. We've uh, had the privilege of uh, taking our uh, minds through this particular chapter and in our first study, in the first 17 or so verses, we were looking very much at a, 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 a saviour who was moved with compassion. And we thought how he was able uh, to bring healing to the centurion's servant, and then he was able to restore life to the widow of Nain's son. And these uh, had the background of his heart, of love, uh, towards needy fallen mankind. In our middle section of the chapter, we thought of his commendation of John Baptist. We observed that John was in prison and uh, sent his disciples with the question, Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? And the Lord Jesus, after giving uh, the proof uh, seen in the many miracles that were being performed at that time, uh, was able then to move on and uh, give a great commendation uh, with regard to John Baptist. There was none like him. And uh, we are thankful for uh, what the Saviour had to say of John Baptist. And we were reminded that there is a coming day of review uh, for every one of us. And uh, no doubt there is a longing to just to hear uh, the review. It will be fair, it will be true. Uh, there will be nothing in it that shouldn't be and there will be nothing omitted that should be. And we just acknowledge uh, something of... Uh, a day of coming review and we know that in a time of review there is always just that prospect that we may hear the well done good and faithful servant and now in our final study we're towards the end of the chapter and we're starting uh, reading at verse 36 and we're going to just take a minute or two to read the chapter uh, or these remaining verses together and uh, the Saviour obviously is invited into the home of a Pharisee, and that's where we commence at verse 36. One of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment, and stood at his feet behind him weeping, and began to wash his feet with tears, and did wipe them with the hairs of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, he spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman is this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he saith, Master, say on. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors, the one owed five hundred pence, and the other fifty. When they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me therefore which of them will love him most. Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? 
I entered into thine house, and thou gavest me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with tears, and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman, since the time I came in, hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, Thy sins are forgiven. And they that sat at meat with him began to say within themselves, Who is this that forgiveth sins also? And he said to the woman, Thy faith has saved thee. Go in peace. Uh, such a lovely passage of scripture and uh, I suggested to you that uh, as we would come to the passage that we would think of the great contrast, this final section, uh, compassion, the first section, commendation, the middle section and now we're thinking of a great contrast, a contrast between uh, the Pharisee, the man called Simon and this unnamed woman of the city and we see a, a, a complete different attitude uh, between these two individuals. Just as we were concluding our previous study, we did note that there was this contrast between the attitude of people. Uh, just as we were concluding reading, it was very clear that last time we were together, uh, there were those who uh, were willing to receive and to respond to the Lord Jesus Christ. And there were those who had uh, no time for him and he likened them to just being like children in the marketplace. And well, you could just not please them. And some thought of John Baptist, that he was a, 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 a publican, John Baptist, and they said of him, he hath a devil. And then their opinion of the Lord Jesus Christ, because he came eating and drinking, they said he was a gluttonous man, a wine-bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners. And so we saw the difference and the split between these two groups of people. A little earlier last week, we saw that all the people that heard him and the publicans justify God. They said God was right, being baptised with the baptism of John. There were those who responded positively. But the very next verse says, The Pharisees and lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves, being not baptised of them. And this spirit of contrast is very much evidenced in the passage that we're looking at together this evening. Can I commence by saying that I do firmly believe that this is a, a different incident from that that you find in Matthew and in chapter 26 when uh, Jesus was in Bethany. Uh, there is a similarity. He's in the home in Bethany uh, of a man called Simon. But I think that that and possibly the alabaster box it's mentioned uh, would be where the two passages are uh, different. Uh, there's no doubt that the passage that we're looking at tonight in Luke chapter 7 was in the early period of the Saviour's ministry, that time when he ministered predominantly in the area of Galilee. When he come to Matthew in chapter 26, he's moved into a different area altogether. He's now in Judea, and in Judea there is this town of Bethany. And it's in that home at Bethany that uh, a, a, a lady, a woman comes and uh, she brings an alabaster box of precious ointment and poured it on his head, says the scripture, as he sat at meat. And when his disciples saw it, it says they had indignation, saying, To what purpose is this waste? Uh, for this ointment might have been sold for much and given to the poor. And John tells us that, in fact, in chapter 12 of John's Gospel, that it was a, a Mary, Mary of Bethany, who had taken a pound of ointment of spike in her very costly and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the odour of the ointment. Now, uh, as I say, I firmly believe that these are two different incidents. What we are facing tonight in Luke chapter 7 is a different lady altogether, in a different place altogether, uh, from what you would find uh, later in both of these other Gospels, Matthew chapter 26 and in John chapter 12. Let me also say that uh, I firmly believe that the lady in question in Luke chapter 7 is not Mary Magdalene. Now, those of you who are of my vintage would remember that in the 70s, uh, there was a movie out, Jesus Christ Superstar, and the movie portrayed this incident, and uh, the woman in this incident is referred to as being Mary Magdalene. Now, we do know a little about Mary Magdalene from the Gospels. We don't come across her in Luke until one chapter later from where we are tonight, because it's in chapter 8 and verse 2 that we first read about a certain woman which had been healed of 
whom went out seven devils, uh, uh, and uh, it, she's called Mary Magdalene, out of whom went seven devils. So uh, Mary Magdalene hasn't featured yet in the Gospels until in chapter 8 of Luke. And again, reference is made to Mary Magdalene at a much later time uh, in Mark's Gospel, when again reference is made to her as a woman out of whom the Lord had cast seven devils. Uh, and uh, one of the ref references on the resurrection day was, in fact, possibly the first appearing it was in fact to this woman called Mary Magdalene. But uh, I again don't feel that the woman in question is uh, Mary Magdalene. Uh, I, I think the, the, the women present different aspects of need. Uh, Mary Magdalene obviously had these seven devils and the Lord cast them out of her. Uh, this woman in uh, Luke chapter 7 has a different moral need. And she's just described to us in our passage as a woman in the city which was a sinner. And I think the general uh, understanding of that type of language is that this was an, an immoral woman uh, and therefore would be distinguished from Mary Magdalene uh, who had these evil spirits within her. In the uh, movie Jesus Christ Superstar, there is a song that Mary Magdalene supposedly sang and the words it's put to the song really are quite blasphemous because it indicates that uh, I don't know how to love him, what to do and how to move him. I've been changed, yes, really changed. In these past few days when I've seen myself, I seem like someone else. I don't know how to take this. I don't see why he moves me. He's a man. He's just a man. And I've had so many men before. In very many ways, he's just one more. And the insinuation there is to a relationship between Mary Magdalene and the Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, such is, is so awful to our minds to even contemplate that. Uh, but there's no suggestion in Scripture that Mary Magdalene was an immoral woman at all. And her need was not of that. And yet the Saviour moved and he cast out the demons. And so uh, can I submit to you a different lady uh, from that that we find at Bethany and a different lady from that suggested by this movie as being Mary Magdalene. And to all intents and purposes, this is just an unknown woman who comes into this home and is found at the feet of the Saviour. And so we want to think about our passage and our four little headings. We want to think, first of all, about the invitation that was extended to the Saviour. And that's we find at the opening, and it comes from this man, Simon. In verse 38, we want to think a little about the position that the woman takes, and she's found at his feet, and she's found behind him. And we're going to have to learn a little about that. And then in verses 40 to 42, we want to think a little about the illustration that the Lord Jesus Christ uses with regard to uh, the lessons that we need to learn uh, from uh, this particular incident. And then uh, the final concluding uh, verses 44 to 50, uh, we're going to think a little about the application and how uh, this could uh, uh, apply even today. We're thinking then about a contrast between these two individuals, Simon uh, the Pharisee and this woman of the city. When we come to think about a, a Pharisee, there's a, a dictionary definition and, well, it's helpful in a sense. It just says a Pharisee was a member of an ancient Jewish sect distinguished by strict observance of the traditional and written law and commonly held to have pretensions to superior sanctity. And that's how the dictionary it would refer to uh, the Pharisees. Uh, another reference goes on to speak about the Pharisees as being uh, people who would be self-righteous uh, or hypocritical person. And we might even apply that today and say that the person was being Pharis uh, Pharisaical. And we're just thinking about maybe an attitude or, or how the person is acting and they're being self-righteous or they're being hypocritical. Uh, Paul in Scripture in Acts 26 gives us a little definition too uh, with regard to how he would describe a Pharisee. And of course, he is speaking of himself. And in Acts 26, he says, which knew me from the beginning, if they would testify that after the most strictest sect of our relig religion, I lived a Pharisee. And so there was a man who lived and acted as a Pharisee 
and he says that there were men who had a strict observance of the Jews' uh, religion. What is interesting to think of what the Lord's opinion was. We thought a little last week about his opinion of John Baptist, uh, but when the Lord Jesus comes to speak of these Pharisees, and again in Luke chapter 11, he will say, Woe unto you, Pharisees! And he would catalogue some of the things that they would do, and uh, they would tithe of their mint and rue and all manner of herbs and uh, pass over judgment and the love of God. And uh, they would obviously be so particular in one sense. And yet in the big matters of life, they, they, they would be so careless uh, with regard to their relationship with God. He would say, woe unto you Pharisees, for you love the uttermost seats in the synagogues and greetings in the markets. Woe unto you Pharisees, for ye are as graves which appear not and the men that walk over them are not aware of them. There was this spirit of hypocrisy that seemed to be about them. They loved to be seen, uh, and they loved to be given place and prominence, and they loved to make sure that outwardly uh, they were so clean and correct and, uh, uh, and so upright. And yet, on another passage, he says that really inwardly they were just full of uh, dead men's bones. And, and so the Lord Jesus has that to say of the uh, the, the, the Pharisees. In, in Luke chapter 6, uh, the Pharisees are found again in the company of the Lord Jesus. And on this occasion, it says that they watched him. Uh, although they were a religious people, they had no time for the Lord Jesus Christ. And there was, as we've seen, a, a complete rejection of him. And there was ever this uh, attitude that they would try and find fault with him. And so both in Luke 6 and in Luke 14, uh, we read that they watched him uh, and on these occasions it was really with regard to whether he would heal on the Sabbath day. Uh, they were more inclined to lay greater stress on the, uh, on the observance of a day than the needs of a, a, an individual uh, to be healed or cleansed on that day. And there was again uh, hypocrisy that marked them. And uh, again, there was obviously a, a question with regard to even the, the washing of hands and they took issue uh, with the Lord Jesus with regard to that as well. Uh, in Luke chapter 5, when uh, the man is healed that is brought into his presence and uh, again, the Lord Jesus uh, healed the man and he said to him, first of all, thy sins are forgiven thee. And they said, who is this that forgiveth, uh, speaketh blasphemies? Uh, who can forgive sins but God alone? And you have almost that similar uh, expression at the end of our passage. And they that sat at meat began to say within themselves, Who is this that forgiveth sins? Uh, and he said to the woman, Thy faith has saved thee, go in peace. Well, in Luke chapter 5, you would know that he said to the man uh, to, to rise and take up his bed and walk. And he, he gave uh, proof that not only could he forgive sins, but he could heal the disease as well. In Luke chapter 15, again, the Pharisees are featured in this gospel. And in Luke chapter 15, they're, find, they're found objecting to the company that the Saviour kept. And in the incident with regard to the things that were lost in Luke 15, the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, this man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. And so they objected to the company that he kept. But that said, and against all of these things, we must never lose sight that these Pharisees could still be reached and Pharisees could still be saved and redeemed. And it's a, a, a chief rabbi, a, a Pharisee that uh, is coming to the Lord Jesus in John chapter 3, the man Nicodemus, the man that came to Jesus by night. And he was the man, of course, who heard uh, the Lord Jesus say, ye must be born again. And scripture just describes him as a man of the Pharisees uh, named Nicodemus. And so uh, a man like Nicodemus could still be wondrously saved. And as I've already quoted to you, uh, the man Saul of Tarsus, uh, he was living after the most strictest sect of the Jews' religion. He lived a Pharisee, uh, but of course we love to remember the fact that he was gloriously saved on the Damascus Road. Uh, and, and so we, we, we try to be balanced uh, undoubtedly, the, the characteristic that marked him in a general sense was that of great hypocrisy. Yet nonetheless, we do see here and there individuals who were gloriously saved. And there is little doubt in my mind that uh, this man, Simon, had 
the greatest possibility that that day could have worked out so differently for him. Uh, he could have been under the great blessing of God's salvation. But I rather suspect that when you come to the end of the chapter, he took his place, uh, not on the side of the Saviour, but on the side of those other Pharisees who really rejected him and who said, who is this that forgiveth sins also? So we come to think a little about the man's invitation and one might wonder, well, why? What motivated the man to ever want the uh, Lord Jesus Christ to come into his particular home? And again, one might uh, presume certain things, one might assume certain things. And when you think again of the general background of the Pharisees, was it just to be seen? They loved to be seen uh, and they loved to do things that were right, it would appear. Uh, and perhaps it was just that outward uh, motivation that ever in, uh, caused the man uh, to invite uh, the Saviour into his house. And it's lovely to note that the Saviour responded and went. And of course, we do find him uh, in quite a number of homes in uh, Luke's Gospel. Uh, we thought a little of John Baptist as the man that was out in the wilderness. And they said that he had a devil. And because the Lord Jesus Christ came and perhaps was a little more sociable and went into different homes, uh, they said he was a gluttonous man and a wine-bibber. But I was just thinking of not only was he here in this uh, house of Simon, but when you go back to Luke chapter 4, he was in Peter's home. Uh, you remember that Peter's my wife's mother lay sick of a fever and the Lord Jesus went into the home and wondrously ministered to uh, Peter's wife's mother. In Luke chapter 5, there's not a Pharisee, but a publican. Uh, Matthew the publican, one of the disciples, called to the Lord Jesus Christ's side and to service uh, for the Lord Jesus Christ. And in Luke chapter 5, uh, we note that uh, Levi, or Matthew, uh, made him a great feast in his own house. And there was a great company of publicans and others that sat down with him. And the Saviour was in the house of a publican. And here in Luke chapter 7, he's in the house of a Pharisee. Luke chapter 8, you'll find him in the home of, of Jairus. You'll remember Jairus came uh, because of sickness within the family home and uh, particularly with regard to his daughter, 12 years of age. And uh, the Saviour said that he would come and heal her. But uh, travelling to the home, of course, we know that uh, the Saviour was told, trouble not the master, your daughter's dead. But Lord Jesus said, fear not, only believe. And he entered into the home of Jairus. So again, uh, we find him in the home of Jairus. And then when we move over into that period of his uh, ministry in, uh, in Judea, uh, moving towards the cross, well, in Luke chapter 10, uh, we find him in the home at Bethany, uh, the home of Mary and Martha and Lazarus. So he is associated with uh, these different homes and perhaps others uh, in this gospel and in other gospels as well. And we just learn that the Saviour uh, was able to go into the home of the publican and he was able to find himself in the home of the Pharisee. And yet in all of these different situations, uh, uh, some were blessed. And yet sadly, a man who sat at meat with him and a man who had him in the proximity of his own home and in his own room. And yet sadly, he did not come into the blessing of the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we think about just the invitation and we simply learn something about the Saviour's willingness to be in these different situations. And then we want to think a little in verses 37 with regard to the woman of the city. She came into the home and we want to think a little about not so much the invitation but the position that this woman adopted in coming into the presence of the Saviour. I said to you already that the likelihood that this was a woman with an, an immoral background, I noticed that most commentaries would actually say that with regard to the woman. One I read said this, Behold a woman in the city which was a sinner. This is a remarkable sinner. It is a word generally so used and applied to women signifies a prostitute or at least one of an ill report as to chastity. And so she certainly was known and her reputation almost went before her. And there's no doubt that even Simon knew something of this woman, woman's background because, uh, again, in his thoughts and in his mind process, which we're coming on to, he said with regard to the Lord Jesus that he should have known that this woman was a sinner. 
I, I think that when we come to that little expression, was a sinner, uh, I, I think that we need to probably understand that this is not so much this time of conversion uh, with regard to this woman's experience. I, I think the references here would seem to indicate, to me anyway, that she had had a previous meeting with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, it, it doesn't matter if you feel that this was the day of her conversion. Uh, we could make the same application. But I think the language, to me, seems to indicate that there had been a previous time. Uh, and if that is the case, then she's not now found at his feet uh, with regard to that need of, of salvation. But she's found at his feet with regard to the principle of adoration. And she brings her box uh, to present thanks and worship uh, with regard to an experience that she has already had in uh, meeting with the Lord Jesus Christ. So I, I think that really is uh, the looking back to her being a sinner, uh, but the de sin question has already been dealt with. And we want to think about her uh, as being now uh, a woman who comes to the feet of the Saviour with a appreciation for him. Uh, again, I, I just thought with regard to women and uh, the part that we find them in Scripture and we know that they're found and they're given place in Scripture. People would tell us that the uh, the Bible is anti-woman. Uh, and yet, uh, when I turn to Luke's Gospel, for instance, I've indicated that uh, Luke's uh, Peter's wife's mother was healed in chapter 4. But even before we get as far as that, uh, women have a role. There's Elizabeth, the mother of John Baptist, and She's given prominence. prominence. There's Mary, uh, the, the, the virgin that obviously bore the Lord Jesus Christ. And then, of course, there's Anna uh, that spake of him. And it's lovely just to acknowledge the part that women had, uh, even in the days of his incarnation. Uh, the next chapter in Jairus' home, it's a, a girl uh, that is wondrously healed. Uh, in chapter 8, he will go on to heal then a woman uh, who had had an spirit of infirmity for 12 years, uh, and uh, in chapter 13, he heals a woman who had been crippled for 18 years. Uh, in chapter 7, where we are uh, today, he's anointed by this woman of the city. And in chapter 10, we find him in Bethany and he's associated with Mary and Martha in the home there. Uh, in chapter 15, it's a woman who finds uh, the lost coin and uh, the picture there is of Again, the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, of uh, of his search for the lost sinner. And it's a woman that's used in the, uh, the parable there. Uh, in chapter 18, there's a, a, a another woman and she's coming to the unjust judge with her request. And it's a woman that's featured there. Uh, in chapter 21, it's a, a widow woman who casts her two mites into the offering. Uh, and we see the prominence given there and in the day of resurrection, of course, uh, and in the day of his crucifixion, uh, women stood by the cross and women found are found uh, coming to the tomb. And Luke doesn't stop just at the end of his gospel because uh, he goes into his writing of the book of the Acts. And again, in chapter one, he talks about the, the time of prayer. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the woman and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his uh, brethren. Uh, and so let me, uh, again, just clearly make the point that uh, the Bible in no way is anti-woman, and they feature large in our Old Testament, in the Gospels, uh, and in the epistles as well. The Apostle Paul was so grateful for women uh, who ministered to him. But notice with me her position, and she's found coming behind him. It is, no doubt, the position that you would anticipate a sinner taking and being found at his feet as well. And both are indicative of that repentant condition. And it's good just to remember that there was a need for every one of us uh, to come uh, behind and to come at his feet and in acknowledgement of our need uh, just be found at the feet of Christ. But it's good too just to remember that we still have uh, just that same need that uh, uh, we must never ever, uh, dare I say, be on uh, the position of being over familiar. I know that he is the friend of publicans and sinners uh, and I know that we sing of him as the friend of little children and yet we ever need to acknowledge that he's Lord 
and there is that uh, due reverence that needs to be given to him. And so in the experience and in the joy of sal our salvation, it's good to remember that there's still the need to be found uh, at his feet. It was said of the leprous man who was healed. You remember the ten lepers uh, that were healed and uh, the Lord Jesus sent them uh, to the priest. And in going to the priest, they realised that the cleansing had taken place. And one returned. Remember, the cleansing had already taken place. And so he wasn't now coming to the Saviour's feet to be cleansed. But we read about that leprous man. He was found on his face, at his feet, giving him thanks. And it's good just to acknowledge that in the spirit of thankfulness, we can come to the Saviour's feet. And so that was the position uh, that the woman took, but note to her contrition. Uh, there was this weeping, and we did read about her weeping and began to wash his feet with tears and did wipe them with the hairs of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them uh, with ointment. Uh, I understand that the, the meaning of that word weeping is she was raining tears. It wasn't just the odd drop that was falling from her eye. And there is a, a depth of experience in this woman. And again, no doubt we could make application that the sinner uh, who is genuinely repentant may well be in that position of raining tears, just so sorry and so saddened uh, by all of the sins and the transgressions uh, that they have committed and might be found in that situation uh, of raining tears upon his feet. But uh, to think too of a, a, a genuine believer in Christ and in that fullness now of worship and thankfulness it is found like this woman and she's found at the feet of the Saviour and she's washing his feet with tears and she did wipe them with the hairs of her head. Uh, there's a lovely aspect of the washing that the Lord Jesus teaches uh, in the upper room and while it's not the washing with tears, he does indicate that there was a need for these disciples to have their feet washed. They were men that had been bathed with regard to the matter of uh, the sin question, but day by day they needed to be washed as far as their feet was concerned and we believe that it was the water of the word uh, that would keep them clean and it's only as we're rejoicing and joying in the water of the word that we would have perhaps this experience of being able to come and wash his feet with tears of gratitude and of thankfulness. Uh, and again when it comes to this idea of kissing, uh, it, if her tears were plentiful, I, I think it, this is true with regard to the kiss as well. It wasn't that she kissed once. Uh, it, she went on kissing and she repeatedly kissed the feet of the Saviour. Uh, the psalmist says that we need to kiss the Son uh, lest he be angry and ye perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. And again in that wonder of the relationship that we enjoy uh, with our Lord Jesus Christ, it's good uh, to note that we can have that uh, affection, that true affection, not the outward, not the the showiness of uh, of doing things that are for the public eye, uh, but just that inner, true, deep affection uh, of bringing our devotion and our gratitude. And whether it's seen in the, the raining of the tears or the repeated kissing of the feet, it's lovely just to note the position that this woman took. Uh, I noticed too that she anointed his feet with the uh, with the ointment, and while there is no reference in this particular passage made to the cost of the alabaster box, I, I think you would be aware that in the other incident that that is one of the items that does feature uh, with regard to the cost, and with regard to uh, the the cost of the ointment, you would know that the disciples began to question. Uh, why it hadn't been sold and the money uh, given to the poor. Uh, but this was a woman who was prepared that in her devotion to the Lord Jesus Christ, she would offer something to him that was so very, very costly. Uh, in David's experience of making an offering to the Lord, he said these words, I will not offer unto the Lord that which costs me nothing. And David knew something of the cost of offering to the Lord. So did this woman so did Mary of Bethany and we do trust that when we come together and offer our thanksgivings and praise uh, it's as a result of maybe time spent in his presence privately 
It's maybe as a result of time spent with his word open privately uh, and as a, a result of things that we've uh, benefited from at a cost to us because we could have been doing other things, but we've spent time and we've spent effort in the word and just before and privately, then publicly, uh, we're able to present something that's costly. And we've thought again of the, the widow and she cast in her two mites and it was everything that she came and she gave to the Saviour. And we're reminded of Romans 12 again. I beseech you therefore, brethren, present your bodies a living sacrifice. And so this woman presented something uh, that was costly. Then moving on in our passage to verses 40 to 42, uh, we're thinking about the illustration that the Saviour used uh, with regard to how he would speak of this woman. Uh, and the illustration again is of two debtors. Uh, uh, the one owed 500 pence, the one owed 50 and in the illustration, it's it's not not a parable. It's perhaps something that had happened, and the Lord Jesus was aware of it. But in this thing, uh, this illustration used by the Savior, uh, those who were indebted to whoever it was, the five hundred or the fifty pence, when they couldn't pay their debt, uh, he frankly forgave them both. And the question is, which of them will love him most? And Simon says, I suppose he to whom he forgave most. And we're coming to learn now that there is, uh, with regard to those who have been forgiven, uh, there is just that different appreciation of what the Lord has done for them. Uh, we've thought of these ten leprous men, and nine of them never even came back to say thanks. Uh, and only the one was found returning, and the Lord Jesus said of him, he was a Samaritan. Uh, but we'll have to think of what was done for us and what was paid for us uh, uh, with regard to the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. We sometimes sing, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Uh, sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. And again, we sometimes sing, he paid a debt he did not owe. I owed a debt I could not pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away. And now I sing a brand new song, Amazing Grace, the whole day long, Christ Jesus paid a debt that I could never pay. And in scripture, sin is often seen as being a debt, and here it is, a debt that was forgiven. And it's lovely to remember that our debt, our great debt, has been forgiven uh, by the sacrifice and the paying of that price uh, by the Lord Jesus Christ at Calvary. Sin uh, in Scripture is sometimes seen as a disease. Uh, the Saviour again in Luke 13 says about the woman, Ought not this woman whom Satan hath bound, lo, these eighteen years she came, and looking on, everybody assumed it was a disease. And, uh, well, the Saviour put his finger right to what the problem was. Satan had bound the woman, and it was a, a disease that had bound her. Uh, but the Saviour uh, liberated the woman, and uh, sometimes sin seen as a debt, sometimes seen as a disease. Uh, sometimes it's seen as a defilement, and there's a need for cleansing. And we sometimes sing, wash me in the blood of the Lamb, and I shall be whiter than snow and of course you would know sometimes it's seen also as a death we were dead in trespasses and in sins and we've been quickened we've been made alive and so there are different illustrations of the great work of salvation uh, but here the illustration is very much that of a debt and our debt has been paid in full tetelestai is the word paid in full uh, by the Lord Jesus Christ through his sacrifice at Calvary I then we want to think a little about the application of this. What does it all mean? Well, what it really means is that uh, as far as Simon was concerned, it was probably a waste as we think of what the disciples said with regard to the time when the alabaster box was broken and the Saviour was anointed at Bethany. They said it was a waste and it could have been put to better use. But what we're not thinking about, what Simon thought about, or what the disciples thought about this offering, uh, what we want to think about is what the Lord thinks about the offering. And the Lord Jesus says, he turns to the woman at verse uh, 44, and he says, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house. Thou gavest me no water to wash my feet. She has washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of the head. Uh, thou gavest me no kiss. This woman has kissed my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint. This woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto you, To whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he saith unto the woman, Thy sins are uh, forgiven. 
And it's lovely just to think that there was a, a, an appreciation in heaven, that heaven records its appreciation of what this woman did. And it also appreciates and records what Simon didn't do. And, well, that's equally important. Uh, we know that at the great white throne, the books will be opened and they'll be judged out of the books. And it will record what the unbeliever has done. And I suppose chief amongst the list will be the very fact that they've never, ever trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. But heaven has recorded that. Well, when it comes to believers in Christ, we are very much aware, too, that at the judgment seat of Christ, the, the, the books will be opened and the records will be made known, they'll be revealed. And, of course, there will be the gold, the silver, the precious stones, but there will also be the wood, the hay, the stubble, and heaven will have a record. But the record of heaven with regard to this woman is, it's all with a tribute to her. Uh, both with what she did with her tears and what she did with her ointment and what she did with her kiss. And it's good that her devotion would similarly uh, be recognised in that coming day. The question is asked in Malachi, will a man rob God? And the children of Israel wondered why the question is being asked of us. Wherein have we robbed thee? It is a question that they come back with in Malachi chapter 3. And the Lord Jesus says, well, you've robbed me in tithes and offerings. And there just is that possibly that I might be robbing God, not giving him the time and effort that he is due and is worthy of. And similarly with regard to these nine leprous men. And so he says to the woman, your sins are many. Uh, there's no doubt that in the picture, the illustration, she's a 500 pence debtor. And perhaps Simon may well have been just that 50 pence debtor. But of course they were both debtors. And they both needed to have that debt paid in full. Uh, but it is only the woman in the illustration who had her debt uh, fully paid. The Saviour says she loved much. Now that of course was not the basis of her salvation. Uh, that's referring back to the fact of her life before her salvation shall love much. Her salvation is based, as we read at the end of our reading today, in verse 50, is based on faith alone. Thy faith hath saved thee, go in peace. And so salvation is only based on uh, the woman's faith. And it's true with regard to every other illustration with regard to the works of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the next chapter, uh, we'll read about that woman who had uh, come to touch his garment 12 years she had had the issue of blood and he turns to the woman and he says daughter be of good comfort thy faith hath made thee whole go in peace uh, we've thought of him speaking to the centurion at the opening of chapter 7 I have not found so great faith no not in Israel and so it wasn't the love that brought her into the blessing of salvation it was faith but love characterised her from that moment forward, a love for the Saviour that saw him now coming with her appreciation and her adoration of him. And it's lovely just to put it all together and as we draw the chapter to a close, to look back in our experience too to a time when we came to his feet and we knew the joy of salvation, sins forgiven, but to acknowledge that there is a privilege day by day of being found at his feet to present our thanksgivings and our worship to him and just to appreciate that these are things that are noted and observed by heaven itself and there will be that future day of review. Now let's just commend ourselves to God in prayer. Father we just bring again our petitions to thee in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and give thanks for what we've drawn from a little passage of scripture with regard to the approach of this woman to the Saviour, uh, not so much in her need, but in her deep appreciation for what the Saviour had done for her. And we just pray, Father, that little practical lessons will remain with us and that we might uh, just manifest a similar degree of appreciation and thanksgivings for all that the Saviour has done for us. We seek thy blessing, Father. We commend ourselves now to thee and give thanks in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ.